Good morning, everyone, and thank you once again for an opportunity to teach God's Word. It is a joy and privilege, and it's something that I truly enjoy doing. And I hope that this lesson will be a blessing to everyone um, as much as it was for me. I would like to begin today with a broad question. And that question is, what did you want to become when you were a child? In other words, what was your childhood dreams? I'm sure some of you want, dreamt of becoming an astronaut. I hear often people want to become a doctor, and maybe other people, an uh, athlete, a star athlete in a professional game. And for those who wanted to become a doctor, maybe some of you are thinking today that thank goodness that God didn't call me to become a doctor. Because I can't handle blood, I can't handle all these grotesque um, inert. Um, and for other people, maybe you did become who you wanted to become as a child. Some of you might have found out that your dreams came true at this age and that this is exactly what you're passionate and what you love to do. When I was a child, I wanted to become like my role model. I wanted to become like um, someone that I respected. And as a boy growing up, you always know that there's one person that you can rely on, one person that you can trust, a person that, that will stand for you, that will comfort you in time of hardship, someone that you can rely upon, that someone that was wise, that knew more than you did, someone that I dressed up like, I would act like him, I would try to talk like him. For me, this figure that I wanted to become like in my future dream was Michelangelo from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> and when but growing up, you find out that reality is harsh. That, re that truth is something that every child has to face one day. And for me, that was the hard truth that my, my lifetime goal and dream was never going to come true. That I was never going to become a giant turtle <coughs> that changed in, through chemical, um, um, uh, through chemical contamination. But that's good for me now, because I'm glad of who I am today. And I'm confident that I can say in front of you that my desire, more than anything today, is to teach the Word of God. To form lives. To change the world through the impact of the Gospel. And I can also stand before you today confidently saying that I know in my heart that God has called me to this task. And it is, it is no greater joy and comfort to know that your desires, passions, and something that you love doing is exactly what God desired me to do. So I want to ask everyone today, what has God you do become? Or what, where has God placed you today? What is God's calling in your life? What is your desire? And does your desire match what God did? God has for you. And for me, the... Bible story that we're going to study today, 2 Samuel chapter 8, the story of David and his many battles, is an example of how David's call as king matched God's appointment and desire for him. I believe the biblical passage today teaches us this message. When our goals and desires are in sync with God's plan for our life, God aids us, even in our ordinary tasks, to fulfill our divine calling. And furthermore, great figures of faith, such as <clears throat> Jesus Christ our Savior, Abraham, Moses, and David, provide models of how to live a life of obedience to God's calling and God's desire for us. Let us pray. Dear God, I ask that today you open up our hearts and minds, that you draw us ever closer to you, speak to us, I ask them that you guide us this moment and that you will teach each one what, you, what is your desire for us today. Amen. I would like to begin with a broad picture of the chapter we'll be studying today. 2 Samuel chapter 8 can be divided into three sections. And the first section concerns David's military campaigns that were fought in the west and east of Israel. 
and the second section and the middle section, which focuses on David's north and south campaigns, is the most lengthiest in an area that is in focus. Um, this is the part that I believe the theological message is crystal clear and emphasized. So we'll spend some time um, studying this portion. And then in the third portion, in the conclusion, it describes how David ruled effectively over all of Israel, which is in the areas that David conquered in the, the preceding battles. Geography plays a critical role in the structure of, and theology of the text. I know that most of us are not too familiar with the geography of Israel and the ancient Near East, so I took the liberty to help create a visual aid so we can know um, these places that are mentioned in the text. The first battle that David fights in chapter 8 is against the Philistines, who are located in the southwest shore of the land of Israel. And then we see that there's a horizontal line that is drawn by the next battle that is described as a battle against Moabites, who are in the east, who live in the east of um, Israel, in what we call the Transjordanian area. Following this and this, we actually go back, go to the north, northern side of Israel against battles and fought against um, Syria, the city-states of Aram Zoba, and Damascus. Then we move southwards to, uh, to um, account of how David controlled the kingdom of Edom in the far south of Israel. So when we pay attention to these geographical details, we realize that the text is structured in a way that forms an X or a T. And um, the areas that are mentioned specifically are the edges of the kingdom of Israel or the area that David controlled. One is the edge of the west, east, north, and south. And this literary technique actually appears in other ancient inscriptions that we find. We find them from inscriptions of Assyria, as well as the Persian Empire. And the rhetoric behind this literary skills of picking um, these countries or cities at the far edges of each um, direction is that everything within those realms is un un encompassed within the king's reign and rule. And even within our uh, American culture, we see something very similar happen in American song. The famous song, America, it's, um, it's beautiful, it has these words. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. <clears throat> we find out that um, this la these last words, from sea to si a shining sea, actually refer to these oceans that are on the two edges, the western edge and the eastern edge of, the, of America, which is the North Atlantic Ocean and the North Pacific Ocean. What, this, what, the, what these words are describing is that all of America, not just um, these edges or parts of it, but in the all of America is what is being described and communicated in these words. So in a similar way, the biblical text is doing, mentioning these cities and um, countries so that we know that David had control of a vast empire and everything in between. The... <laughs> The passage that we're going to be studying today reads this, the first two verses. After this, David won the battle against the Philistines, and he took the most important city from the Philistines. He won the battle against Moab and had them lie down on the ground in straight groups. Two groups were put to death, and one group was kept alive. The Moabites became servants to David and paid taxes to him. Often when we read the Bible, we pay attention to what is being said. But equally important is how things are being said. And I'm sure many of us through our daily life have learned that that is the truth. How we say things to people influences how the message is perceived, understood, and is critically important to the message itself. In a similar way, in God's, or God's great wisdom and guidance, the biblical author 
meticulously and carefully crafted the Word of God so that the future generations and audience can grasp the message, the theological message that lies beneath the biblical text. The text begins this way. Um, the first battle that David fights is against the Philistine. And although in the version, that the new life version that we use in our class, doesn't do a great job of showing this literary sequence. In the Hebrew and other English translation, it becomes very clear that the text is structured in a way that is consistent. That is, it starts with David smote the Philistines, um, or struck down the Philistines. Second, it then describes that David subdued the enemies that he just um, won a victory over. Then third, um, David gains an important city from the Philistines. In the following battle against the Moabites, the sequence continues, or is repeated. We see that, just like the account in the Philistines, we see that David smote, or struck down Moab. And then, in the second element, um, we have a more detailed account of how God, uh, how David subdued the enemies. And in this, in, in this case, we read that against Moabites, David put um, the Moabites in line, and two of the lines were um, struck down, and one was spared. And then, in the third element, there's a slight variation, but still it communicates the same message, that the Moabites became servants to David and paid taxes to him. Although the first in this section that we're talking about only spans two verses, and it's very brief, I think it sets the foundation in understanding the following verses. And moreover, this great brevity of, of this passage is really surprising in many ways, because, especially in light of the important role Philistines and Moabites play in Israel and David's history. Because we remember, if we can remember, the Philistines were the chief enemy of the Israelites. Not only did Saul fight many battles against the Philistines and, were, and ultimately died in battle against them, we also remember that the great story of David and Goliath where David fights the Philistines. Also, concerning Moab, we, we remember the book of Ruth where the family genealogy of David actually goes back to the Moabites. So in, despite this important role Philistine and Moab play in the history of Israel, the text itself is very brief in the matter of, in matter of fact. But we, we find out that one thing that the text does communicate is that David is successful in battles, that he is really skilled at his um, ordained task of being a king and quelling these um, rebellions or enemies, um, neighboring enemies of the people of Israel. Also, the text primarily function to set up a literary pattern that we are to expect and to notice. These, um, these goes in three steps. First, David smites an enemy. Second, David subdues the enemy. And third, David gains wealth from the battles that he just won. The reason why this pattern becomes important is because in the following section, when there's any variations in sequence, when something goes missing, when something is added, when some area is reworded, us as readers are to notice it and pay attention because in those instances is where the message and theology of the text is most clearly communicated. And even within um, American culture um, that we have, they do, they do a very similar stylistic or communication, communication skill. Um, as you know, I am a father of two daughters, Annie and Alina. And being a father to two daughters means I watch a lot of Disney princess <laughs> movies. Um, and ever since the very first Disney movie, there's this constant theme that is repeated um, in many of the Disney princess movies. From the first movie that Disney produced, um, or the feature animated film, Snow White, the theme of the true love kiss is central to Disney's princess movies. Um, this is repeated with um, Sleeping Beauty, where Aurora wakes up into the true love's kiss, as well as the story of Ariel and this 
um, <laughs> The Little Mermaid, where Ariel, um, a true love's kiss is supposed to break the spell, or make the spell for Ariel a permanent one, that she can permanently become human. And in one of the most recent movies, um, Frozen, though, they actually make a twist and change in this concept of true love. And that is, true love is not simply a love between a princess and a prince, but it's actually a love between siblings. And this switch, or change, in the rhetoric is crucial to the, main, to the theme and the message of the movie itself. So let's then take a look at how the biblical text continues. The following verses read this. Then David won the battle against Hadadezar, the son of Rehob, Reho, king of Zobah, as he went to get his power again at the Euphrates River. David took 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers from him. He cut the legs of some of the war wagon horses, but saved enough of them for 100 wagons. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezar, king of Zobah, David killed 20,000 of them. Then um, he put groups of so soldiers in Damascus of Syria, uh, in Damascus of Syria, the Syrians became servants to David and were made to pay taxes to him. The Lord helped David every place he went. This account of the battle with the Syrian king um, of Zobah reflects in the account of the David's battles with the Philistines in following the same sequence. First of all, we see that David smites his enemy again, but in this instance, we see a change and a switch. For the first time, the name of a king is mentioned. Up to this moment, we see that the Philistines were a people group and Moab was a nation, but the first time the biblical text intentionally includes the name of a king. And I'll come back to why this is, and this is important mm -hmm. later. Then, in the second element, we see a detailed account of how David subdued his enemy. Although in the translation that we just read, um, it uses the word took, um, I think it's a better, a better way to translate the Hebrew term is actually captured. Because the, in all other instances when this word took appears in the chapter, it's the same term, but in this instance. In this instance, the Hebrew, Hebrew is intentionally different to, know, to help us know that this actually belonged to how David treated and subdued the people of um, Syria. In light of this, what becomes also apparent is the third element of how David gains wealth after the ba battle is surprisingly omitted. And following this narrative, we read that um, the battle against Damascus, David, um, after defeating Hadadezar, we read that the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezar, and David smote Damascus. Um, the sequence continues that David put groups of soldiers in Damascus, and just like with the Moabites, we read that the Syrians became servants to David and were made to pay taxes to him. But at this point, we encounter a new element in our sequence. And it's very important to note. The biblical text states, The Lord helped David every place he went. Up to now, we've noticed some key changes that happened in the sequence. And the first one was the name of Hadadazar. And the question is, why does the biblical text only mention his name as the enemies of, of Israel? And I think it's very intentional um, in its rhetoric. Because um, in Hebrew, the, the name Hadad Ezer means Hadad is help. I think some of you might not be too familiar with who Hadad is, but what we see in this picture right here is a still an archaeological artifact that was recovered from the land of Syria from about the time of David, and it portrays the storm deity Hadad standing upon a bull with lightning bolts in his hand. 
Um, and in the Bible, we read of Baal, and we also know that Baal is a Canaanite god. But the Hadad and Baal are basically the same or very similar deities that uh, they're remembered as deities of storm and of rain. And were very important for um, the pagan myths and religion at their time. Once we realize that Hadadezar's name means Hadad is help or my help, we realize that the normal physical battles that David fought actually reflects a spiritual battle. Namely, that David's helper is Yahweh and that Hadadezar's helper is Hadad, the storm god. And who comes victorious, comes out victorious in this battle? It is Yahweh and David. Through this we realize that David, that David's God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one and true God, the powerful God, that even other Canaanite, Canaanite and Syrian deities cannot match up to. That God rise up victorious. That the true helper is Yahweh. And we also further find out that um, with the reference of Damascus, we saw that one unique detail is that for the first time, uh, a neighboring nation of the enemy comes to help the battle, in the case with the Syrian battles that fought in the north. And that also reflects an irony that is happening in the text. Because Hadad Ezer not only needs the help of his deity Hadad and still gets defeated, he furthermore needs the help of humans, of his allies who from the city-states of Damascus, and even with this human help, he flats, falls down, flat down to the ground and loses, that the victory is in Yahweh. Finally, we talked about the fourth element that was introduced that read this, Yahweh helped David everywhere he went. So, time and time again in the biblical text, what is emphasized is that Yahweh helps David. That even in our daily tasks, Yahweh is our helper. God helps us. That even with enemies coming and coming our ways and in, diff in times of difficulty and challenges, God is there as our ultimate help and one that is faithful to his followers. Now, we're, the following verse says, reads this, David took the coverings of gold which were carried by Hadadezar's army and brought them to Jerusalem. And he took a very large amount of brass from Hadadezar's cities, Bethon and Berothai. In verse 9 it says, Now Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had won the battle against the whole army of Hadadezar. So Toi sent his son Joram, king, king David, uh, to King David to greet him and to pray that good would come to him, because David had fought against Hadadezar and had won. Hadadezar had been at war with Toy. Joram brought with him objects of silver, gold, and brass. David set these apart to the Lord, together with the silver and gold he had set apart from all the nations he had taken in battle. He had taken silver and gold from Syria, Moab, the sons of Ammon, the Philistines, Amalek, and from the things taken from Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, King Uzzobah. So the question here is, why is there this sudden uh, detailed account of David gaining all these wealth and gold? Well, this indirectly connects to what, I, what we noticed earlier, that in the account of the battle with, between David and Hadadezer of Zobah, there was a peculiar omission. Namely, what was omitted was details of how David gained wealth through the battle of Hadadezer of Zobah. And uh, we see that in out of sequence, we have an extended account of how this happened in, in these verses. I think it communicates four main, uh, main things. First, David brought the coverings of gold to Jerusalem. Second, David took a very large amount of brass from the Beta and Berothai, which both belonged to uh, the area of Zoba. And then David set apart all the silver, uh, um, also Toy and Joram brought objects of silver, gold, and brass. And finally, that David set apart all the silver and gold, everything that he gained, 
meat for the Lord. When we do a word study on the term gold in the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, we find out that gold is the metal that appears most frequently in the Bible, and actually 285 times. And because of the prominent role gold plays in the biblical text, the biblical author uses the imagery of gold in, to communicate theological truth. That there are actually um, both, the gold can reflect both positive and negative spiritual conditions. Let me start with the good news. The good news is that material wealth can reflect God's favor and blessing upon an individual. And we can read this from the examples of Abraham and Moses. Abraham, after um, leaving Egypt with, the, uh, with this narrative about um, Abram and Sarai, we read that he was, became very rich in cattle, silver, and gold in Genesis chapter 13. Also, with Moses, during the Exodus account, as in the Israelites were getting ready to leave the land of Egypt, we read that God made the Egyptians favorable towards the Israelites and that the Israelites were able to gain much clothing, silver, and gold through the Egyptians. But now, I'd like to turn into the bad news. The bad news is that material wealth can also test a person's faith and faithfulness to Yahweh. Um, and what is important as we read the account of David is that in the book of Deuteronomy, we actually read a qualification, uh, expectations of how Israelites' kings should be. And in that text, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it specifically says, a king must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Therefore, the, how David treats the silver and gold directly reflects his obedience to the word of God as well as to Yahweh. And what the text says is this, David set aside all the silver and gold to Yahweh. We actually find out that even though God gives um, wealth and riches as a way of blessing someone, time and time again, what a faithful character would do, a, someone that walks with God, what their response to these financial blessings is to return and give back to God and to build um, the universal church. We read with the story of Abraham in Genesis 14, after the great, gaining great wealth from Egypt and winning further battles against um, a coalition of four kings, Abraham offers 10% of all he had to King Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High. And with the story of Moses, we read that the Israelites gained much wealth of silver and gold, but in chapter 35, it actually describes a scene when the Israelites come together to offer silver and gold to build up the tabernacle and all the, um, the objects within the tabernacle. And impo another important one is this an example that we read from the book of Joshua. Joshua, following the famous battle of Jericho, actually gained a lot of silver and gold. But despite the fact that he gained much wealth, Joshua knew that what he needed to do was to dedicate all the silver and gold and brass and iron for the temple uh, treasury. In contrast to these positive or good examples, we also have negative examples of what, what gold and silver can bring and bring a, bring a downfall for an individual. A contrast to the example, positive example that we just mentioned with Joshua, we have the story of Achan. After the battle of Jericho, the Israelites fought against a city called Ai. And Achan, one of the Israelites, um, uh, during the battle, saw that his enemies had much silver and gold. And he decided to keep for himself 200 shekels of silver, 50 shekels worth of uh, bar of gold. And Yahweh was not pleased with Achan's um, action. In fact, we read that the, jo the consequence for his selfishness, um, keeping these things for himself, resulted in the, uh, in the loss of the Israelites against the, the, in this battle of Ai. And we also read that um, the Joshua and uh, no, Achan and all of his family 
results in death, a death penalty um, sentence to them. We also read the story of Saul, and it's the, one of the reasons why Israel's first king, Saul, lost his responsibility and role as king is because he kept for himself the best sheep and cattle um, during battle. And this ultimately results in his failure of kingship and his loss and disqualif disqualification as king of Israel. So the fact that David gains much silver and gold and still chose to dedicate it back to Yahweh paints David in a positive, faithful, faithful way that he followed the examples that went before him of Abraham and Moses. And not only that, there is a contrast between David, the ideal faithful king, and Solomon, who chose to, who chose to live a life of disobedience. Verses 13 and 14 reads as in the follows. So David's name was very respected when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. And he put groups of soldiers in Edom. In all Edom he put soldiers, and all the Edomites became servants to David. The Lord helped David every place he went. The account and the sequence of David's interaction with Edom is slightly different. Um, many of these changes are reflecting probably a favorable relationship the Israelites enjoyed with the Edomites. Um, but the first element is key because it says that David's name was greatly respected amongst, um, amongst his enemies, and especially when he returned from smiting Damascus. We remember that the, this is reflecting the fulfillment of God's promise to David in the previous chapter, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God makes promises to David, that David's name will become great, that he will give um, um, peace to David and victories over his enemies. And so far we have found out that Yahweh is faithful to his promises in making, uh, um, fulfilling all these, all these promises spoken to David in the previous chapter. The sequence continues, David put in um, groups of soldiers in Edom just like he did when he, he, after his victory against Damascus. And the third element, all the Edomites became servants to David. And finally, there's a repetition that the Lord helped David every place he went. At this moment, now that we are done with all these battles against these four nations, it is important to reflect that this is not the first time Israel had to face nations, enemy nations from surrounding. In fact, we know that King Saul himself fought against his enemies on every side as described in 1 Samuel chapter 14. The nations that were mentioned in that list is Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. We find out that in many of these nations that are mentioned in this passage for Saul is repeated in our very chapter. And I think this, this similarity and similar sequence and list is very intentional that it causes the readers to make a correlation between these two kings. In contrast to Saul, who ultimately is the 